So hi, I'm Wei Dai from Bain Capital Crypto, and today I'm going to be talking to you about why zero knowledge is not the full solution to privacy preserving applications. I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, the, the reason why and, and the solutions going forward. Right. So first, first of all, since I'm like the first talk, uh, one of the first talks here, raise your hand if you have prior knowledge of zero knowledge, you're familiar with zero knowledge. Should see every most. Okay. So so I can, uh, since I'm most everyone raise their hands, I'll just speed through the slides. Uh, what is a zero knowledge proof? Well, it's, for, it's a way for a prover to convince a verifier about, about a statement succinctly, right? So the prover here, uh, uh, prover and verifier would take in some common input uh, circuit C, and um, uh, the prover will prove, produce a proof to the verifier that is short, uh, that verifier can, uh, can, can verify in, you know, in, in time that is independent of, of the circuit C, right? So, uh, and, and so typical provers are, you know, mobile uh, clients, right? And, and typical verifiers are like chain applications, like EVM uh, contracts. And, you know, there's certain problems we want, such as succinctness and non activity, which I've shown in this diagram here, right? And there's other uh, properties such as uh, transparency, uh, transparency and universality, which means that uh, you can change uh, the circuit without having to run additional trusted setup, right? And there's additional security properties such as completeness, uh, uh, zero knowledge and knowledge soundness, which I will not uh, go into detail here. And of course, uh, we have seen an explosion of, of works uh, you know, along, along these lines because of you know, academic works uh, that advance the state of the arts as well as industry efforts. Right? And second question, do you think that zero knowledge will solve all our privacy problems uh, you know, for blockchain applications? Raise your hand if you think yes. <laughs> okay, good, okay, all right, all right, so, all right, so, all right. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I think the answer is no, and, and I think it requires uh, a careful reasoning, right? And why zero knowledge is it's not the single solution to our privacy problems. And so here is, uh, you know, the, the outline of, of the talk. So, so first, we'll, we'll actually go through uh, the reasoning on why zero knowledge, uh, you know, is actually in contention with on-chain composability and on-chain share, share state, right? And we'll see, actually, you don't need to use zero knowledge for the for your full state transition. And you can structure your application so that you use transparent computation for your on-chain part, right? Uh, you know, while sacrificing privacy for that portion. And then for the second part, we're going to talk talking about how FHE can actually help with the part that ZK does not do, which is confidentiality for on-chain states. Okay. And at the end, I'm going to uh, show you uh, a kind of a way forward, maybe in like you know five, uh, uh, three to five years, what we can have if we can program computation between zero knowledge, trans, you know, transparent computation, and FHE. Okay, so let's get started. So first, uh, you know, what is a computation? So in this talk, a computation is just going to be a state machine, right? So it, it keeps some states, and you will, you will take in inputs, and you will update the states. Right? And uh, you know, typical state machines are, you know, blockchains are state machines. Here, a block is uh, an input, right? And, and the blockchain is essentially the chain of states. Right, uh, and or, or actually, each smart contract application can be seen as uh, a state machine. Right, so each call to the smart contract is an input, and uh, responding to the input, the smart contract will update its states. So, state machine is really just you know a nice uh, abstraction for most applications that, that we know of that keep states. So, uh, how would you do you know privacy for state machines generally? Well, you could do zero knowledge updates to state machines, right? And so this is actually what is done, uh, you know, with Zexi, uh, or, you know, in the company like Alien Mina, where uh, update to state machine it's it's done via zero knowledge, where the zero knowledge proof will um, will say I have some states, uh, starting states, I have some ending states, and I have an input that actually make the state machine go from the starting state to the ending state, right? Uh, and, and then this entire package of state update is submitted to chain, and the chain will verify the proof and then uh, modify the state. So uh, you know, this is okay, but you know, what's the problem with this? The problem is, of course, that there's you know, race conditions that uh, arise when you do such a state transition, because your state, uh, your, your state update proof ties to your previous starting state. So therefore, if two users try to update the same state at the same time, uh, one, of, one of the updates will not get through. And so, uh, so this is really the problem with uh, you know doing general state transitions in zero knowledge. And uh, and so because of this, 
uh, you know, applications, if you want to do the entire state transition in zero knowledge, what happens is that your full zero knowledge application essentially have a server that sits off chain that process, that sequences transactions. So this is, you know, almost like a roll up, right? Um, and so, um, you know, the trade offs are yes, you gain scalability, and, uh, but you actually do not gain that much privacy uh, because, because the zero knowledge provers, um, you know, on, on the side actually needs to know the information, needs to know the secret witnesses, uh, you know, to, to produce the proofs. And, um, and you actually completely lose on-chain composability, right? Compared to the uh, transparent counterparts, which we know a lot on Ethereum, where you get uh, composability by default, where smart contracts uh, expose their interfaces to each other. So, um, uh, but actually, you don't need to use zero knowledge for the full state transition, right? So, for instance, on, on, the, on the right side here, we have you know, zero knowledge for the full state transition, where the entire state update is computed off-chain. On the left here, you can actually use zero knowledge for something like a range check, where you do not actually um, you know, touch the state inside the zero-knowledge proof. So therefore, the proof is never invalidated uh, when the state is updated. Right? And in the middle here is actually applications where um, your, your state can be updated, but, and your proofs actually touch the state. But when the state is updated, your proof is not val invalidated. Right? And so this is, you know, for instance, like Zcash, actually, you know, if you uh, because of the uh, insertion only Merkle tree, uh, if you say that I have a node in a Merkle tree, if, even if the Merkle tree is updated, meaning there's new nodes come in, your, your, your proof is still valid because uh, you know, old, old trees, you know, no reliefs are never deleted in, in such application. And so if you, if you actually construct your states carefully, you can actually gain uh, you know, essentially uh, concurrency with, with you know, zero knowledge proof type, type of updates. And I would say that um, actually, uh, this, this type of structure can be made uh, composable on-chain. Uh, you can you actually build anonymity, uh, well, applications with an anonymity while sacrificing pri privacy. Um, I, I won't go into details here. Uh, so for instance, as they connect, it, it you know, actually uh, achieves uh, such a property uh, using zero circuits. And so now let's actually move on to the, to the second part of the talk, which I think is uh, the most interesting, which is how do we actually use uh, other techniques to uh, complement zero knowledge, right? Um, and so, uh, if you look at you know the two type of computations we have that we can program right now, you know transparent on chain and zero knowledge off chain, um, you know they each have their uh, trade offs. And the question is, can we have private input right to confidential on chain computation? And the answer is, uh, it's actually a yes. You know we can we can actually do this uh, if you do MPC or FHE on chain, right? And with essentially security uh, that's uh, similar to the the uh, you know majority assumption of, of uh, consensus protocols. And, and the way we do this uh, is, you know, in this talk, we're going to be focusing on fully homomorphic encryption, right? And uh, so let's uh, briefly go through, you know, what FHE is. And, and really briefly, it's really just a way for, for you to do computation over data that is actually encrypted, okay? And so we'll have a public key, which is out to the public that everyone will know, and a decryption key, which should be uh, kept hidden, right? And with a public key, you're able to encrypt messages. So here, each M is going to be uh, you know, a single bit. And for any circuit that actually computes over these uh, plain text bits, you're able to evaluate that circuit on ciphertext. So here, I'm writing uh, brackets to mean that something's a ciphertext and hides the underlying message. Right? And, and so with FHE, you're, you're able to do computation over ciphertext. And later on, when you decrypt, you actually get back the, uh, you know, the circuit output. Right? And so, uh, in such a form, your, uh, the computation is you know, done in, a, in this confidential, confidential manner. Um, and so, it has been you know, in a very active area of research for you know, more than a decade. And uh, efficiency of FHG schemes has been improving um, you know, over, over the past, uh, past years. And uh, the kind of current state of the arts libraries have support uh, about a uh, you know, couple of thousand uh, binary FHG operations uh, per second. Um, and so, uh, but here, you know, there's still a problem, right? Because if you hold the decryption key, then you can see the data, right? And there's a single point of failure. So whoever holds the decryption key gets to see all the data that's encrypted ever to the public key. So how do we fix that? Well, the solution is uh, threshold cryptography, right? And so with threshold cryptography, you want to share the authority with a secret among a group of servers so that uh, if k of them, you know, usually say two thirds, cooperate, then you get uh, essentially all the liveness guarantees. But you know, as long as no more than k minus one of them collude, then um, 
you get essentially security. Okay, uh, and so these are uh, really useful for for blockchains uh, when you set the threshold to be around uh, you know two thirds. And uh, and indeed, in recent years, there's been numerous works using threshold cryptography in different settings. Um, in particular, you know, for, for light clients, in, in the case of threshold signatures, and for front running protection, uh, and, and also you know private trading in in, in the case of uh, threshold encryption. And it turns out that people have actually studied threshold FPG. So there exist threshold FPG schemes. Uh, actually, no. Uh, uh, getting ahead of myself here. Um, so there's a canonical way of doing uh, threshold cryptography, which is called Shamir secret sharing. And, and there's many, many different techniques uh, that's proposed uh, in recent years, which we'll not get into detail to, that actually manage these Shamir secret keys among a dynamic group of visitors. So this means that servers can come in and out of the consensus sets, and you can reshare the secrets among this group of servers. And uh, and it turns out that we actually know how to do threshold cryptography and FPG together. And this means that for the decryption key, we will secret share it among a group of servers um, and you know, have this threshold guarantee on um, you know, liveness and security. Right? And, and there's actually only a single work outlining how, how this will work. So, so yeah, if you are an FPG researcher out there, um, I encourage you to you know, think more about threshold uh, FPG. There's, there's not, just not enough work on uh, improving uh, you know, Threshold FPG at the moment, and we, uh, you know, if if you buy the, the idea of my talk, then we we really really need threshold FPG for blockchains. Um, and so so why do we want to actually decrypt, uh, you know, during consensus? Well, you, as you will see uh, in the later slides, that applications actually need to communicate between the confidential parts and the public parts, right? We need some form of inf information release to actually make our applications work, and, and I will show you why. And so. Uh, before we you know, jump into uh, applications, so you know, what are we actually doing here? So uh, we talked about FHG and threshold FHG, uh, you know, but we're, you know, we want to do blockchains, right? So what are blockchains? Blockchains are state machines replicated uh, in consensus, right? And so it turns out, actually, if you want to do threshold decryption uh, in consensus, there are some um, you know, um, subtleties in that you actually have to change your consensus mechanism to also include decryption. And you want to guarantee that uh, decryption happens if and only if a block is finalized. So uh, you know, I won't go into details here, but uh, just you know, take my words for it that there's ways to essentially take any uh, you know, best team fault tolerance uh, consensus protocols and have it support threshold decryption um, so, so that this property will hold. And so, uh, so for the rest of the talk, we'll, we'll assume that we'll have a consensus mechanism that replicates a state machine which supports threshold decryption for, for FHG schemes. Okay? And we'll fix some uh, single public key that's essentially uh, the chain public key, right, for, for, the, for, for, the, for, the, for our chain. And now, so our question is, uh, you know, how do we actually program this state machine, right? We have, we have a state machine, but, you know, how do we actually, like, build useful applications? And the second question is, you know, why is this any, uh, any useful? FPG is slow, you know, zero knowledge is already slow by itself. Uh, you know, what does this actually buy us, right? Uh, and so that's hopefully what will convince you of uh, that we can actually build uh, you know, maximal privacy preserving applications with this, if, if this is possible. Um, and so, um, so let's take a look at the like, landscape of these three type of computations, right? So for transparent on-chain, uh, you know, we have like, you know, EVM and WASM-based solutions, you know, with different frameworks to program them. And for uh, zero knowledge off-chain, you know, there's a lot more libraries that you can use, but, you know, there's different proof systems and, you know, different libraries. And for FPG, actually, uh, if you want to do threshold FPG, there's actually no existing library to do it. Um, but in this talk, uh, I'm going to abstract away over all of that and just say, okay, we're going to uh, essentially write pseudocode. Okay, uh, I'm going to demonstrate to you that uh, if you're, if you, if we do have a framework to program all these, you know, different computations nicely, then we can build application in a very, very expressive manner. Okay, and uh, it's going to be codenamed PESCA, meaning uh, it's a privacy enhancing smart contract architecture. Okay, uh, and so, uh, so. So what, what will this look like? It will look like just any other smart contract. But the computation is going to uh, essentially, you know, marks, uh, you know, with, with for, for, for different parts of the computation, right? So we'll have the standard on-chain transparent computation, which is essentially replicated and SU on-chain, right? And we'll have, uh, you know, user, user uh, computation, which is actually computed off-chain, right? To encapsulate what the users uh, will compute. And we'll have zero-knowledge circuits, which encodes the off-chain off proving parts and on-chain verification parts, as well as the FHG circuits, which, which are going to be 
uh, computed confidentially on chain, right? And so, um, how we how we actually build applications? Well, we're still going to use zero knowledge circuits, in particular, you know, the Zcash like zero knowledge circuits to actually keep our token accounting, right? But instead of uh, just doing everything in zero knowledge, we'll have an interface with our FHT circuits, meaning we'll actually uh, encode the values, oops, <laughs> the values that uh, the uh, zero knowledge circuits uh, essentially uh, prove to, uh, as input to these uh, FHT circuits. And we'll do the FHT computation and uh, so I should decrypt some crucial output bits, right? Which we'll then use in the transparent computation to uh, do further processing, right? So application logic really happens uh, on-chain in the FHG circuits and the transparent parts. Okay, so, so this might sound vague right now, but uh, hopefully you know, you'll clear up once I show the later slides. Uh, and so the idea is, uh, you know, for zero knowledge circuits, we're going to use Zcash in this particular case. We're going to use the, you know, the most recent edition of Zcash called Orchard and change the value commitment to be a value encryption that's under the threshold uh, FHG public key. Okay, so we're going to keep a Merkle tree and a notifier set. So if you're familiar with Zcash, this is exactly how, how Zcash works. And uh, the circuit will make the following modification. So it, it will say that, you know, the circuit will say, I have some net value change that, uh, you know, I have spent some nodes and created some nodes, and I have, I have encrypted this net value change uh, against this threshold uh, FHE key, right? And, and, and encoded in some transaction dot encrypted value, right? And, um, and on the processing part, uh, you know, we simply verify that the genetic proof is constructed correctly and, you know, do some additional processing, right? So this process will actually, is actually, does not balance itself. So, so like, you know, there's a net value change that's not accounted for. But, but, but we'll essentially balance out the, the encrypted value inside of FHG circuit. Um, and, you know, of course, there's a ways to generate uh, these transactions. And, and so, so this, uh, this type of contract will allow us to have a Zcash type, uh, you know, to show the token pool to interact with the FHG uh, circuit-based application. So, so really quickly, uh, you know, what is the first application that, that we could build? Well, one, of the, one example is, you know, constant function market makers, right? And, and so these are like really simple markets which match, uh, you know, buyers and sellers to liquidity providers, right? And it's a mechanism that's uh, essentially a very, very simple. It only keeps track of two numbers, which is the reserve of um, uh, amounts in, you know, the asset A and the asset B, right, of, of the liquidity pool. And there's some trading function that's uh, actually very simple. In, in this case, you know, in this case of Uniswap, it's actually just uh, the product of A and B. And so, uh, what do we mean by privacy in this case? In this case, uh, w we actually want to hide uh, mostly all the information, right? So both the uh, the, the, tr the trader identity and amounts that you know we want to hide, right? So it's actually very very hard to tr hide the trade amounts because it actually reveals, uh, you know, what, uh, so, so the, if you reveal the, the spot price, it actually reveals where your trade amount is. So, so therefore, we, you know, we, we would like to actually release the spot price programmatically so to, to hide um, the, the trading price, essentially, you know, for arbitrary long. And so, uh, so let's look at how, how to actually build this. So we're going to use the previous contract that we have shown, which is, you know, essentially a modification of Zcash. And we're going to keep uh, FHG state, which will encode these two, two numbers, in, uh, encoding your states, right? And here is the FHG circuit. It's, it's really, really simple. It just simply computes the uh, CFMM trading function, which is just a multiplication and comparison and setting output bit. So this output bit zero, 1 or 0 will denote whether the trade have gone through or not, right? So it simply checks, checks the you know, validity check and either update the states and outputs 1, where it does not update the states and output 0. Okay, uh, and so how do we uh, interface with this? So we'll have some additional transparent computation that will interface uh, with this FHG circuit. You will first process uh, the funding transaction, right? So the funding transaction is, uh, you know, you want to swap some, some Ethereum to USDC, you will actually uh, spend your Ethereum first regardless of whether your trade is valid or not. And the user will actually construct both a refund transaction, right, that refunds the, the, the you know, the, the Ethereum, and you will construct also an, uh, a payout transaction, which actually pays out the USDC. And inside the FTC circuit, you will actually compute whether your trade is valid or not, right? And depending on whether it's valid or not, uh, you will actually uh, control the refund or, or the output. 
OK, so isn't that I might be a better short on time? So it, as it turns out, there's actually subtleties when you want to do this with you know, FHG states. There's actually attacks where an attacker can take an FHG state uh, and copy it to a, an attacker contract and attempt to decrypt everything. Right? So you need to like, uh, kind of prevent this type of attacks. And there's ways to mitigate this by essentially saying that every single FHG state and FHG input must be uh, accompanied by a zero order proof of knowledge uh, that the user actually knows what the state is. Uh, that's tied to each contract. Okay, uh, so you know there's a way to do this essentially with dollar proof, right? Uh, and so, um, uh, and the last application I'll, I'll mention is uh, auctions, right? So uh, we know what auctions are. Uh, so uh, I'll just quickly mention what we're doing by privacy in this case is that we want to run an auction where bids are not revealed to anyone even after the auction is over, right? Uh, and, and this is uh, traditionally not really thought about. Uh, and it's actually really, really useful for multi-round auctions if your bids are, are hidden uh, for later rounds. And again, there's a way to do this. And the trading function is, is really, really simple, where you just compare the, the, the bids to the max bids and either update it or not. Okay? Uh, and so uh, and with that, I think I'll just conclude since I'm short on time. Uh, and the paper on, on PESCA will, will appear soon. And, uh, and we're hiring. Uh, if you're interested uh, in any of these topics, working on zero knowledge, FHE, Virtual cryptography, uh, come con contact me. Thank you. Perfect. So there's time for five, uh, five minutes for QA before uh, we take the first break. Yeah. Yeah, two quick questions. <clears throat> In the opening, you mentioned one that you, know, you need sequencers to prevent trace conditions, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes. So, like, you know, if you were at the last talk, like, you know, what Patrick was saying that you can have essentially provers also MPC, right? So, along those same lines, yes, you can decentralize the sequencer, but, you know, it, it's morally speaking, are you just building a chain at that point, right? So, if you really think what those sequencers are doing, they are coordinating among themselves, you know, maybe using uh, MPC or, or threshold techniques to, to essentially hold on to secret information, right? So, it's, it's, it's actually along the same similar lines where your sequencer becomes a chain. Uh, I think, you know, if you really spell the details and have it support general applications. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, that's how we're approaching it in the meetup, so that's why I'm curious. And then, secondly, um, you mentioned, you know, like, with just with the current ZKP, like, ZKP, like, schemes, uh, that you can't get in, like, good privacy for these applications, right? Are you suggesting that only for, like, AMM type stuff that requires constant on state chain? Or do you also propose that you can't, like, any other type of application? No, I, only only for application. Uh, yeah. So the question was, um, you know, is CKP bad for privacy only for share state applications or for applications, you know, uh, like you know, for data verification and stuff like that? So uh, the, the the point is really that for these applications that require share states, like you know, on chain MMMs and uh, you know, auctions where. You have, you're, you're keeping track of like you know comparison of different bids. So whenever you need to compare users' inputs, right? Like meaning you need to compute over shared inputs or have a shared state where users will access and read and write, then it's really hard for ZKPs to provide privacy in that context. But when you have private states that's particular to a user, then I, I believe you know ZKPs suffice in, in that case. So for instance, you know uh, if you have pri you know, tokens that's hold, held by one person, right? Like in the case of Zcash, then zero knowledge works perfectly, right? trader itself, I just like put a sm small amount per block, just kind of probing query because um, I assume this is kind of like a permissionless system. Yeah. So in that case, like how much information leakage uh, I can get by just like constantly sending kind of probing transactions under this uh, uh, like uh, AMM over FHG scheme? Um, I believe, uh, you know, it depends on how you design it, right? So yeah, it is definitely possible that if you send a transaction, if it goes through, you know, you know the price is above, you know, or maybe below a certain threshold. And if it does not, then uh, uh, you know, you know, you, you know, essentially you gain a, a binary information of, of the state, right? Um, and so uh, the, it, it actually turns out for these MMMs, you actually want to release the state periodically because 
you know, you want a user to be able to trade. So if you have no idea what the spot price is, you cannot trade. So I think, uh, so this, I think more uh, along the question of like mechanism design, you want to release price soon enough so that users can actually trade against it, but uh, not too soon to lose privacy, but also soon enough to, so, so that people don't probe, their, probe the uh, spot price themselves. Right, I think, I think, agree, but it's actually binary part, right? It's, it's actually not binary information. You actually get the like, full size if you have a probing query. And de depending on the, I feel like there is kind of balance of like, because it's permissionless system, I mean, pr presumably you need to pay more, right? Because you need to trade itself to do this kind of a probing query. Right, but I think still, um, I, I just find it's kind of hard to like, quantify the information leakage you can get from these kind of uh, probing queries. Right, right. So the question is, you know, what exactly is the probing query uh, leakage for the information that you gain? In this case, for the construction I've shown here, for actual trade, it's actually binary information. It's either you went through or not, right? So when you construct the trade, you need to actually construct the exact uh, trading price you're, you're, you're asking. Uh, and so if the spot price is below that, you'll get executed. If it's not, then you will not. Uh, it's just particular to this construction. There's no, there's no slippage in, in this uh, construct that I'm showing here. And it turns out it's actually really hard to build flexible slippage price because you will need to compute uh, essentially encryption inside FG circuits, which is uh, a lot more inefficient. So in these con two constructions, I'm trying to keep the FG circuit extremely small. Um, sorry, like, okay. quick, quick second question. Is there a way that we can, using not full FHE, just like some homomorphic crypto uh, primitives to get a relatively kind of like a poor man's burn of this vision? Yeah, yeah, so I think, uh, so you can actually net all trades with just uh, you know, partially homomorphic encryption uh, by simply aggregating trades. And this is uh, what uh, Penumbra does, for instance. And I think I'm out of time, so with that I'll conclude. That's it, thanks, thanks, Wei.